Hey everyone, my name is Eric and I'm so glad you're joining us for worship today. We're about 10 minutes to go before the service begins. While we're waiting, we'd love to know where you're watching from. So say hello in the comments and tell us what city or state you're in. Now is also a great time to like and share this video right now so more friends and family can join us for worship this morning. I'm looking forward to this time for us to connect online as we worship through song, prayer, and as we hear a message from our senior pastor, Dr. Stephen Rummage. Thanks again for being here. Service will start soon.
Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us online today, Easter Sunday, 2020. You're going to be blessed this morning as we worship the risen Savior together here. We want to encourage you to continue to find resources online at qsbc.org slash resources. And then thank you for your faithfulness and giving. You can find more information about that online at qsbc.org slash give. In your faithfulness, we are grateful. Let me pray for us as we worship the Lord through giving and as we begin our service today. Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to gather in this creative way. Lord, we do pray that you continue to work with this epidemic, this pandemic, with the COVID virus. Lord, we pray that you'd protect those that are directly and indirectly impacted, Father. We thank you for this way to be able to gather today and worship you, our risen Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Thanks for joining us this Easter Sunday. Here's a look at what's happening at Quell Springs Baptist Church. We want to say thank you to Jacob Mitchell, who has been helping lead our worship in our 930 service for over three years now. Jacob was the worship intern under Rick Cordova and has since grown to be a key leader with us during this interim season. We are grateful for his heart for ministry and will be praying for him as he transitions to lead worship at Bright City Church with Rick and Amy Cordova. Church family, will you join us as we say thank you to Jacob by either commenting right now on the live video or by sending him a direct message. We have a new virtual Bible study starting soon that addresses how to trust God even when life hurts. The study will walk through a book by Jerry Bridges that talks about three essential truths about God to help us understand that God is completely sovereign, infinite in wisdom, and perfect in love. For those interested, there will be an online informational meeting about the study on April 19th at 4.15 p.m. There's no commitment required to attend this meeting. Simply email Chris Doyle at cdoyle at oklahomabaptists.org for details. Connect groups are a vital part of our church, and we love seeing how groups are finding meaningful ways to meet during this time through technology. This past week, we had close to 50 groups meet virtually, with more than 500 people included. If you are not in a group, we'd love to help you find one. Email Jerry Ross at jross at qsbc.org to get connected. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great Easter Sunday, and we'll see you next week. On this Easter Sunday, when we celebrate the risen Savior, I am grateful that to those who believe, he gives access to God. And through prayer, we can approach his throne at any time. And church, we've been praying over these last several weeks that God would continue to be at work in the life of our city, our state, this nation, and across the world. And we've even heard of even good progress happening, not just with the pandemic and with the virus, but also in the lives of individuals, people coming to faith in Jesus during this time. Church, we want to pray specifically this morning for three things. We want to continue to pray for our leaders as they make decisions as it relates to the virus and and the pandemic and and when we can begin to make changes in, in our lives. We want to continue to pray for students and families. Many of them are now in distance learning. Many are being homeschooled there in their own homes, and we want to continue to pray for those parents as they lead and shepherd their kids through this time. And then we want to continue to pray for the churches. Our church and and our sister churches in this city, but also across this nation and across this world, that they would continue to reach uh, people with the good news of Jesus Christ. And so would you join me this morning on this Easter morning as we come before God's throne, asking him and pleading him to do a good work among us. Father, we thank you that through Jesus, your risen son, we have access to your throne. And that your scripture says that we can come before you with our petitions and requests. And God, we make these requests known to you today. Father, we know many are still sick, and we pray that you would continue to bring healing to them. And for our frontline workers, our medical care, medical professionals, that you would uh, continue to strengthen them and give them wisdom and discernment as they provide care. And Father, we thank you for the progress that's been made as it relates to the virus. We thank you for our leaders that have continued to make wise decisions on our behalf to protect us and to protect the vulnerable. And we continue to pray that you'd give them wisdom from our local leaders to our state leaders to our our federal leaders. God, we pray uh, that you would grant them much wisdom as they make decisions in the days ahead about how we will continue to move and navigate this pandemic that we're in. 
Father, we pray that you'd strengthen them, that you'd allow them to continue to persevere despite the challenges that they're faced with. Father, we pray for families all across this nation, but specifically here in our city. We pray that you'd provide for them. God, we know that many of these students are in distance learning for the rest of the school year, and we know the challenges that that brings not only for them, but also for their parents. And so, Father, we pray that you'd put your sense of presence in and around them, that you'd allow students to be diligent in their work, but that you would also give parents patience as they continue to guide and direct uh, their students through these times. And Father, we pray for churches. We ask that you would continue to use your church to minister to people in this season. Father, we thank you for how you're using Quell Springs here in our community uh, to provide for the needs of those around us. And God, we pray that we continue to be aware of those needs as we continue to push forth the gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ. God, we pray for our brothers and sisters and other churches in and around this metro area that are reaching people with the good news of Jesus through online methods and through meeting the physical and spiritual needs of those that they encounter. God, we pray that you'd do a great work of revival in the hearts of people, that many people in this time would turn towards you. And Father, that you'd use your church to be the conduit that connects those people to you. And God, we continue to pray that we'll see hundreds and hundreds and even thousands of people come to faith in you through this season. God, we thank you for Jesus and that we have a risen Savior, who that through him we have life and we can have it to the fullest. And for any of those that are watching today that may not know that, that God, today, the day would be the day of salvation for them. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning. Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Sunday. We're so glad you're here. I wanted to start off with a little bit of scripture that just talks about our Savior. Let's listen to this scripture together. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And by him, all things are created, whether things in heaven or on earth or under the earth. And whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things are made by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For you see, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, so that through him he might reconcile to himself all things, whether things in heaven or things on earth. And how does he do it? By making peace through his shed blood on the cross. What a glorious day it is to worship our Savior. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me and I see his wounds his hands, his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the
in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face, oh, forever on your face. Sing it out. Oh, praise the darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Sing it out with us. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings.
I'm going to ask the question. And we want you to confidently sing the answer. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? all creation groaning it is. is a new creation coming it is. is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst is it good that we remind ourselves of this
Well, good morning, and on this Easter Sunday, I am so thankful that we can be together in this way, to gather around the Word of God and to hear the Holy Spirit speak to us today. You know, there's something that we do here at Quail Springs every Easter. Churches all over the world do this on Easter Sunday, and it may seem a little bit different for us doing it uh, with me here and, and you in your home, and you may be by yourself or you may be with your family or with some friends, but listen, I want you to do this with me today. There's something that we do. The pastor says he is risen, and the congregation says he is risen indeed. Now, don't leave me hanging out here all by myself. I'm going to say he is risen. I'm trusting that you're going to respond. He is risen indeed. So let's do it. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. And we know that he is risen indeed. I am so thankful on this Resurrection Sunday day to be able to come together and to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Let's join together in prayer, and then we'll hear what God would say to us today from his word. Father in heaven, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for this good day that you've given us. Lord Jesus, we praise you that you are risen indeed. And though we are separated from one another as a church family, Lord, you are with us. You are in our midst. And Lord, we know that your presence is among us today. So Lord Jesus, move me out of the way and speak a word of encouragement, a word of victory, a word of resurrection power to your people today. We'll give you glory and honor and praise for all that you do, Lord. For we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, I want you to take your Bible, if you have a copy of God's Word with you, look with me in Luke chapter 24. Today we're asking this question, what does Easter mean to you? What does Easter mean to you? There's a beautiful old story about a Sunday school teacher. He taught a children's Sunday school class, and for Easter Sunday he had prepared and, and gotten his children ready for what they were going to do as a special Sunday school lesson that day. He wanted each ch child to bring in a plastic Easter egg and inside of that egg to put something in that represented some aspect of Easter. So Easter Sunday came, and all the different children came in with their plastic Easter eggs. Each one would bring the Easter egg to the teacher, and the teacher would open it up, and he would talk about whatever was inside and make a spiritual application of it. And so one little girl handed him an egg, and he opened it up, and there was a flower inside. And he talked about how that represented new life and how Jesus gives us new life. Then another child gave him an egg, and he opened it up, and it was a picture of Jesus drawn in crayon. And he talked about Jesus and his life and his death on the cross. And then another child brought him an egg, and he opened it up, and there was a nail inside. And he talked about how Jesus was nailed to the cross with his, through his hands and his feet with large nails. And then they brought another little egg to him, and he opened it up, and there inside of that was a rock. And he talked about how the the stone sealed the tomb of the Lord Jesus, and so on and so forth. Each child would bring their egg. The last child who brought his egg was a little boy named Brian. Brian was about seven years old, and he was mentally challenged, and, and everyone in, in the class wondered what he would have inside of his egg. The teacher opened up Brian's plastic egg, and inside the egg was empty. Before the teacher could even say anything, Brian spoke up and said, my egg is filled with emptiness, just like the empty tomb of Jesus. I want to proclaim to you today that the tomb of Jesus is still empty. But that empty tomb, and it seems contradictory to say it, the empty tomb of Jesus is filled. It's filled with joy. It's filled with hope. It's filled with salvation. It's filled with purpose. It's filled with a reason to live each day and a reason to anticipate eternity with our Lord Jesus in heaven. I want to talk to you today about what Easter means to you. So let's look in our Bibles in the book of Luke, chapter 24. We're beginning reading in verse 1 of the chapter. The Bible says this, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, 
they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Wow, what an incredible story, the story of that first Easter Sunday, that Resurrection Sunday, as Jesus rose from the grave. I want to talk to you today about what resurrection, what Easter means to you. First of all, the Word of God shows us this in this passage. Easter means Jesus healing for your brokenness. Easter means Jesus healing for your brokenness. Now, we don't know exactly what time on that Sunday morning Jesus rose from the grave. But we do know what the Bible says happened after he came back to life. The Bible says that an angel from heaven came like lightning and appeared in a snow white robe and he rolled away that stone. The guards who were there at the tomb were, were, get, were dazed and, and motionless because of fear. And God opened up that tomb and, and I'm not the first preacher to have said this, and I won't be the last preacher to say this, but I'm the preacher saying it right now. God opened up that tomb, and God rolled away the stone, not so that Jesus could get out. Because you see, in his resurrection body, Jesus could just show up. He could pass through walls, and he could have gone through that stone in his resurrection body just like water passes through a sieve. God didn't roll away that stone so that Jesus could get out. God rolled away that stone so that the disciples could look in and discover that Jesus is alive. And then early in the morning, before the sun had come up, women began to make their way out to the tomb. They had a sad responsibility. Their, their responsibility and their duty was to prepare the body of Jesus for burial. That they had done some things the day before when he was first laid to rest, but, but now they were making formal and full preparation of his body for burial. As they were making their way out to the tomb, the women began to speak to one another. And there were several women from Galilee who were there on their way out to the tomb. We know the names of three of them, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James. As they were making their way out from the city of Jerusalem out to that tomb, they were talking to one another and asking, well, who will roll the stone away for us when we get there? Because the stones rolled on sort of a track on an incline. And when they would seal the tomb, they would roll the stone down the incline and into place. And that was relatively easy. But to unseal the tomb required taking it out of its place and rolling it up the incline. And so the, the women were asking, I wonder if, they'll, if we'll be able to, to roll the stone away or, or if there'll be someone there to roll the stone away for us. And when they got there, they found the stone was rolled away. And they knew they were at the right tomb because they had watched as Jesus was laid to rest there. But they looked in and they saw that the body of Jesus was not there. Now, here's what I want you to see in the Word of God. When they came to the empty tomb, it did not fill these women with joy. Instead, the Bible says, if you look in verse 4 of the text, it says they were perplexed about this. They were filled with confusion when they came to the empty tomb. And then the Bible says while they were looking, there were suddenly two men in dazzling apparel who these women would have recognized as angels. And yet when they saw the angels, again, they were not filled with joy. They were filled with fear. The Bible says they were frightened 
and bowed their faces to the ground in verse 5. They were filled with confusion. They were filled with fear. Because you see, when your world is broken, it keeps you from being able to see things as they are. You can't see clearly when everything is broken. And for these women, everything was broken. They, they felt broken because they had lost the one they loved so much. They felt broken because all of their hopes and all of the things that they had placed on Jesus, all of those things seemed to have, been, uh, have evaporated and were no longer even real. And so everything they had believed and everything they had trusted in and the one that they had placed their faith in was gone. Their world was broken. So even as they looked at the open tomb, the empty tomb, they could only see confusion and fear. There are some people who are watching right now, and your world is broken, and it's keeping you from being able to see anything that's happening. You can barely keep going forward because everything is broken. Several years ago, Michelle and I were traveling down a highway. We were going about 65 miles per hour. And suddenly for us, at least from our perspective, suddenly a hailstorm broke out and large hailstones were falling. And we were going at such a high rate of speed and, and those hailstones were so large that before I could slow down, those hailstones pelted that windshield and just shattered the windshield of our car into what seemed like thousands of pieces. Well, as soon as that windshield was broken, I, I had to pull over to the side of the road, and, and we had to stop, and, and we had to get somebody to come and help us. Because when everything is broken, you can't see what's in front of you. And when everything is broken, you can't keep going in, in the direction you were going in. Maybe that's where you are right now. You're broken. Th these women were broken because of something that someone else had done to them. Because they had taken their Lord and crucified him on the cross and because they had watched him die, their world was broken because of the actions of others. When Peter heard that Jesus ha had risen, at first the Bible says it seemed to him like a crazy story. He couldn't see clearly why. His world was broken. Because of his own sin, because he had denied the Lord three times, even though he had sworn he would never do that, his world was broken. You see, sin always causes brokenness. We may experience brokenness because of what other people have done to us. We certainly experience brokenness because of our own sin. And we live in a broken world because of sin. Broken families, broken marriages, broken relationships, broken promises, broken hearts, broken lives. All of that brokenness is the result of sin. But here's the good news of the empty tomb. When Jesus rose from the grave, he rose to bring healing to your brokenness. And these women experienced this even on that first Easter Sunday. Notice what the Bible says happened. The Bible says that, that when these women were, were fearful, that the angels began to speak to them. Look at in verse 6 of the text. The Bible says, the angels said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, he is risen. And then he says this, the angel says, remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. The angels drove away the fears that these women were experiencing by calling to their minds the words of Jesus Christ. Remember what he said. He said that he would be delivered into the hands of sinful men. He said that he would be crucified. And he said that on the third day he would rise again. And notice what the Bible says in verse 8. And they remembered his words. These women whose lives were broken remembered the words of Jesus 
and found healing. It reminds me of something I heard someone say one time that just touched my heart. I heard someone say, never forget in the dark what Jesus showed you in the light. When you're going through those times of darkness, when you're going through those times of brokenness and you don't know what to do and you can't see clearly, remember who Jesus is. Remember what Jesus said. And remember that Jesus, who died on the cross for your sins, is risen, he's alive, he lives forevermore, and he promises eternal resurrection life and healing for everyone who believes in him. Praise God, today, Easter means Jesus healing for your brokenness. But then there's a second thing this text shows us that Easter means for you. Secondly, the Bible shows us Easter means Jesus' assurance for your doubts. Jesus' assurance for your doubts. I want you to look with me in your Bible in verse 13 of the text. Beginning in verse 13, the Bible introduces us to two disciples. We know one of their names. His name was Cleopas. The other person's name we don't know. But two disciples, and they were making their way on the eight-mile journey from Jerusalem to the little village of Emmaus. And as they were traveling down that road to Emmaus, these two men were talking about everything that had happened. You see, they had heard the report from these women who said the tomb was empty, who said the angel said that Jesus was alive and that he had risen. That They had heard that, but they didn't believe that. All they knew was that they had been following Jesus and they had trusted Jesus And now Jesus had been crucified, and they really weren't sure about all of these stories of the empty tomb and his resurrection that they were hearing. And the Bible says that as they were traveling, Jesus joined them. I don't know if he was sitting on the side of the road and got up and joined them. I don't know if he came up from behind them and joined them. I don't know if he met them coming the other way, but the Bible says he joined them. But the Bible also says their eyes did not recognize that it was the Lord Jesus. And so Jesus is walking with them, and he asks them, well, what are you guys talking about? He heard them debating and arguing, going back and forth and talking about all these things because they had all kinds of questions. They were asking, why did Jesus have to die? And was he really the Messiah? And and was he a success or was he a failure? And could this story that these women were telling, could it possibly be true? And so he asked, what are you talking about? Look in verse 18 of the text. The Bible says, then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? (laughs) And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And then Cleopas continues telling the story of Jesus. He tells about how Jesus was delivered to be crucified and then how he died on the cross. He told all of those things, and with everything he says, it becomes more and more apparent that Cleopas' heart is filled with doubt. He no longer trusts that Jesus is who Jesus claimed to be or that they have any hope in Jesus at all. Look down in verse 25 of the text, because after the Lord Jesus, still unrecognized by these two disciples, after he's heard the whole story that they're telling him about himself, Jesus says this beginning in verse 25. He said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Stop stop right there. He called them foolish. And here's why he said they were foolish. It wasn't a problem in their mind. It was a problem in their heart. He said, oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart. That they didn't have a knowledge problem. They had a faith problem. Slow of heart to believe, to have faith, to trust all the prophets have spoken. Then he continues in verse 26. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then the Bible says in verse 27, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, 
he interpreted to them in all the Scriptures the things concerning himself. That must have been an amazing time as the Son of God preached a sermon on the entire Old Testament to an audience of two disciples, and the whole sermon concerned himself. Starting with Moses and all of the prophets, he preached all of the Scriptures, the things concerning himself. And so he started in Moses. He may have gone back to the book of Genesis, when after the first sin and the fall of mankind, God promised to send a Redeemer. Or he may have moved into the books of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy through the sacrificial system and the sacrificial lambs and all of the sacrifices that pointed forward to his sacrifice as the spotless Lamb of God whose blood was shed for the sins of of all of the world. He moved on into the Psalms as the psalmist described the coming of the Messiah and into the prophets as prophets such as Isaiah said, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and you shall call his name Emmanuel. He went through beginning with Moses and all of the prophets and proclaimed all of the scriptures concerning himself. He took them to the word of God and proclaimed himself that through the word they might believe. And the Bible says that later on, after they had recognized that it was Jesus, look in verse 32 of the text, the Bible says those two disciples said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Jesus met the doubts in their hearts and brought them assurance as he proclaimed himself. Every time I come to the Word of God, it gives me greater and greater assurance that Jesus is who he says he is. He's the Son of God. He died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. He rose from the grave to give eternal life to everyone who believes. He's coming again one day to judge every man and woman and boy and girl on the basis of this one thing. Have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? And I praise God that when I come to the Word of God, He drives away my doubts and gives me a deep assurance and trust In God. We need that kind of assurance. And we need to learn to place our faith and our confidence in Jesus Christ and Him alone. So many times we're trusting in all the wrong things for our assurance rather than looking to Jesus. Just a few years ago, there was a man up in Alaska who made an inflatable raft mainly out of duct tape. Now, I know right now there are men, you have been at home for the last several weeks. And there are some men that are watching right now. You have done some incredible things with duct tape. You've, you've repaired things you didn't think you could repair, and your wife still doesn't think you have repaired just by using duct tape. There are some big fans of duct tape, and this guy was a big fan of duct tape. So he got his duct tape and, and put together an entire inflatable raft, and the main thing it was made out of was duct tape. Well, the, the day came when he was going to take the raft out, and he was going to go across a channel near Juneau, Alaska. He put the raft in the water. It was just him, his dog, one paddle, and the raft. The water was calm. The wind was blowing about nine miles per hour. He launched out. He paddled. And as he got out, just not too far from shore, that duct ta- tape raft began to, to take on water and somebody had to come and rescue him and they rescued him and and they rescued his dog and 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 the the raft I guess sank because it was just made of duct tape and they withheld his name from the media presumably to spare his dog any further embarrassment but anyway I, I think about how many times we hold on to things and we trust in things that are sort of like a, a raft made out of duct tape things that can't take you anywhere things that won't hold up things that will absolutely disappoint. We trust so many times in the wrong things. I would ask you today, where are you placing your confidence? Where are you placing your trust? Where are you placing your hopes? If you're placing your hopes in your own ability, 
your own ability will fail you. If you place your hopes in your finances or your retirement account or your job, people all across this country and all over the world right now are discovering that is not a sure hope. Sometimes we place our faith in our health and our own strength. And even in these days, we're finding people who, who thought they were very healthy who find their health just running away from them and leaving them very weak and vulnerable. All of those things that we place our faith in ultimately will disappoint us. But when we place our faith in Jesus, when we place our hope in him, he never disappoints. He's risen. And because he is risen, he will give assurance to our deepest doubts so that we can live every day with confidence and with faith in him. I want to show you a third thing that the Bible says Easter means for you. Number three, the Bible says Easter means Jesus' joy for your fears. Easter means Jesus' joy for your fears. Look in your Bible as we continue on through Luke chapter 24, and we're coming down to verse 38 of the text. In fact, verse 36 of the text. The Bible says that, that these disciples who had met Jesus on the road to Emmaus turned around and went back to Jerusalem and they found the other disciples. They found the 11 apostles and, and other followers of Jesus and they were sharing the things that had happened and what Jesus had said and how Jesus had, had appeared to them and spoken to them. And then suddenly the Bible says Jesus was with them. All of a sudden, he just showed up. It's the evening of the day when Jesus rose from the grave, the evening of Easter Sunday. And they're talking about him, and all of a sudden, Jesus shows up. Look in verse 36. The Bible says, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate before them. I want you to think about what happened when Jesus showed up. Just in the middle of that group of disciples, all of a sudden he shows up. And the Bible says at first they were fearful. But when he spoke to them, he said, I want you to have peace. You see, when Jesus shows up, he gives us peace. And then he asked them, why are you troubled? Why are you so fearful? And why do you have doubts in your mind? When Jesus shows up, he drives away our doubts and gives us a new confidence. And then he, he asked them, he says, I want you to see my hands and my feet. He was showing them, this is really me. You can see the, the scars in my hands. You can see the scars in my feet. You can see that I am the one who was crucified. And then he invited them to touch him so that they would know that he wasn't just a figment of their imagination or, or some spirit or some apparition or some ghost or, or some product of wishful thinking, that, that he was real and that he was physically, literally standing there before them. He said, you can, you can touch me. And then maybe because they were, they were hesitant to, to touch him, he said, well, give me something to eat. And he took a piece of fish and and ate it just to show that, that he was a resurrected man in a physical resurrected body before them. Their resurrected Lord. And in the midst of all of their fears, Jesus brought them joy. I love the words that the Bible uses in verse 41 of the text. It says, while they still disbelieved for joy. <laughs> they no longer disbelieved because of doubt. Now it was like, this is so wonderful. This is so amazing. 
that, that I can't believe it, not because I don't believe it, but because it is just so amazing, I can't get over it. They disbelieved for joy, and they trusted in their Lord. And because they had witnessed him, they went out and shared his message with hundreds and even thousands of people, a message that reaches even to us today. What does Easter mean for you? Easter means that Jesus brings healing to your brokenness. It means that he brings assurance to your doubts. It means that he brings deep joy, joy beyond what we can even believe in the midst of our fears. I'm so thankful today for Jesus, and I'm thankful today for Easter. Jerry Jenkins, the Christian author, tells the story. It's a true story of a mission trip that he had been on in the South Seas. He was traveling back to the United States, and his plane had to stop on a small island just to, I don't know, to refuel or, or to do something. But they had to stop. And when they stopped, all of the passengers had to deplane. And they were sitting on a little beach area with a canopy over their heads, sitting on benches. And as they sat there, he said, you could look. And on three sides of them, there were yards and yards and yards of beautiful white sand covered with shells, beautiful shells just all kinds of shells on the sand. He said they hadn't been sitting there very long until small children who were natives of that island came running up to them. All of them had shells in their hands, and they were all trying to get those airline passengers to, to buy their shells. And so they would come up, and of course there were shells all over the place, but they would come up with shells in their hands, and they would run up to the passengers, and they'd say, dollar. And then the passengers would shake their hands, heads and, and, and the children would, would giggle most of the time. And then they'd say, okay, nickel. And so some of them would buy shells and some of them said no. But the man who was sitting next to Jerry Jenkins said, don't, don't buy any shells from those children because their parents send them out to, to sell these shells and they're going to take that money from them and they use it for drugs and they use it for alcohol. So you're really not helping these kids to buy their shells. And so... Jerry Jenkins decided to take that advice, and he, he, didn't, he didn't buy any shells. He said, one little girl, she looked like she was about five years old, came over to him by herself, really after the other children had gone. And she had in her hand, just sort of crammed inside of her hand, three shells, sort of round shells about the size of golf, size of golf balls. And she came up to him. And held out those shells and said a word to him in her language. He shook his head, no. And she was even more insistent. She, she came up again and again said this word. He didn't understand the word, but she said a word to him in, in her language and just kept repeating the word. And he thought that she was saying dollar or good deal or, or pretty or, or something. He just kept saying no. Just shook his head and frowned and said, no, 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 I don't, I, don't, I don't want that. She held her hand out again, this time with tears in her eyes, and said that word that she had been saying. Again, he said, no. This time she walked away, went off to a place by herself. He could still see her. She sort of crouched down. She was really crying, still holding those three shells in her hand. Now she wouldn't even look at him. And he said, man, she's, she's really good. She knows how to do this. And so in spite of his better judgment, Jenkins got up, walked over to the little girl, pulled $2 out of his pocket, and said, here, take this. When he said that, she began to cry even more. And she just repeated that word over and over again. He went back and sat down on his bench and talked to the daughter of one of the missionaries who was on the trip with him. She knew the language of the people on this island. He asked her, what's this word she keeps saying? She says it over and over again, and he said it. The missionary's daughter said, the word she's saying is free. And so he came back over to the girl and said to her in her language, free? For the first time, she smiled, and she said, free. Then she gave him those shells, and he took them, and once again, 
she said, free. The good news of Easter is that everything you need to be saved, everything you need to have joy in your life, everything you need to conquer the fear, the doubt, the brokenness in your life, everything that needs to be done was done when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave. And he gives you every part of God's salvation absolutely free. Sometimes we turn it away because we can't even understand what free means. Sometimes we think, well, I know the Bible says it's free, but, but I still got to earn it. I've got to do something. I've, I've got to be good enough and, and know you can't receive it that way. But if you simply come to Jesus on his terms, turning from your sin and brokenness, turning to him and receiving from him his gift of salvation, he gives it to you and it's absolutely free. As a follower of Jesus Christ, the joy he wants us to have every day is his free gift. The assurance he wants us to have every day is his free gift. The praise that he wants us to offer up to him, he gives us by his grace the ability to praise him as his free gift. And listen, if you're watching today and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, as his free gift, Jesus Christ promises today that he'll save you if you simply call on his name. I want to invite you to pray with me. Just bow your head, close your eyes right where you are, and we're just going to pray a simple prayer before the Lord. Father in heaven, I thank you for this Easter Sunday. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are alive. Thank you, Lord, that for everyone who knows you and follows you, there is healing there is joy, there is peace, there is confidence, not only in this life, but hope for the future because of your resurrection and your promise of eternal life. Father, I join together with my brothers and sisters in rejoicing and praising you for your gift of salvation through Jesus, absolutely free. Now, Father, I pray for those who are watching today who have never been saved. Lord, show them right now how much you love them. And show them today that you will save them if they simply call on the name of Jesus and ask for your free gift of salvation. And in this quiet moment, I want to invite you, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, to pray this simple prayer with me. You pray it in your heart. As I pray it out loud, you can pray a prayer like this. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. I believe that you are God's son. I believe you died on the cross to pay the price for my sins. I believe you rose from the grave to give me eternal life. Right now, Jesus, I turn from my sins. I trust in you and you alone to save me. Give me your gift of salvation. Give me your free gift right now, Jesus. I receive it from you. Save me right now. And I will follow you all the days of my life. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. For I pray this, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Well, if you pray that prayer with me to receive Jesus as your Savior, I'd love for you to do something. There's a number on the screen that you can call, and there's someone waiting to talk to you right now. All you need to say is, I prayed that prayer. You don't have to give a long explanation. You just say, I prayed that prayer, and the person on the line will know exactly what you mean and be glad to talk to you about your next steps with Jesus. There's also a number you can text to, and if you simply text your first name to that number, then that'll get the ball rolling, and someone from our church will contact you and help you take your next steps with the Lord Jesus. We're so thankful that today you've trusted Christ as your Savior, and we want to help you as you follow him. And then for believers who are joining with me today, I say again, he is risen, he is risen indeed. And he gives us joy, and he gives us hope in every circumstance. We may be going through dark times right now, but we can trust in what Jesus Christ has shown us in the light. He is our hope. 
He is our future, and he's got great plans for us in the days to come. Let's keep trusting him. Let's keep looking to him. Until we're together face to face, just know I'm praying for you. I can't wait to see you again. But keep safe. Be well. Know that we're praying for you. And I pray God's great blessing for you today on this Easter Sunday.